In my conversation with Richard Dawkins in October in Chicago, we talked quite a bit about the question of group selection and its implications for evolution. Dawkins and I both emerge from the kin selectionist camp, and so we, are, we do not have a profound disagreement about the nature of evolution in this context, but we do have a disagreement over how to interpret many phenomena, especially related to human beings and their evolution. In more recent times, triggered by I'm not sure what, possibly by discussion of my conversation with Dawkins, David Sloan Wilson, who is one of the leading proponents of the new group selection, as it has been called, uh, was inquiring about my beliefs. He dug up a paper of mine that I wrote with David Lottie some years ago on the evolution of morality in humans and concluded very publicly that I'm obviously a group selectionist, which where I come from that's quite an accusation. So anyway, I took uh, polite umbrage at it and uh, told him that I thought maybe if he was willing that we should settle this on stage given the importance of the question of group selection and kin selection in the history of evolutionary thinking. And he accepted my offer and we are now currently discussing where we might have such an interaction. Can you explain for someone who isn't an evolutionary biologist, maybe isn't familiar with these terms, why this is important? Yes, but it would actually be very hard to convince somebody of the full level of importance. There's an awful lot riding on the question of whether or not evolution takes place at the level of the group. This is dogged evolutionary biology since Darwin. Darwin, in general, was not apparently a fan of the concept. The concept didn't have a name back then, but uh, most of his writings do not suggest group-selected thinking, but there are some places where Darwin does verge into group-selected thinking. And so anyway, this has been a, uh, a ghost haunting the evolutionary landscape since that landscape first came into view. It became particularly pointed in the mid-60s due to the work of William Hamilton and George Williams, both of whom seemed to put to rest the notion of group selection once and for all with a very compelling set of treatments of the question that seemed to indicate that although, and we have to be very careful about this, although there is a force that favors groups of altruists over groups of selfish individuals, it is overwhelmed by the free rider problem, which is to say anytime you have a group of altruists, there is an opportunity for a selfish individual to come in and enjoy the benefits of the altruism from other members of the group without paying the cost of their own altruism. So it seemed very clear for quite some time that although there is some weak force favoring uh, group altruism, that there is a much stronger force favoring the disassembly of group altruism. And so since that time, evolutionary biologists have imagined that altruism, when we see it, is the result of other properties like uh, reciprocity, which can favor altruism, or more basically, kin selection, which says that when, let's say, a mother aids her offspring, although the act narrowly can be viewed as altruism, it is actually a kind of genetic selfishness. She is aiding an offspring that carries 50% of her genes with it, and therefore we can understand this as her advancing her genetic interests even if she is sacrificing her own individual what we would call somatic interests. So of late in the last several decades the idea of group selection has re-emerged and has re-emerged largely as a result of the work of David Sloan Wilson who essentially brought the hypothesis back from the dead and has done a great deal of work advancing the notion that maybe in fact the, um, the putting to rest of the concept of group selection that took place in the late 60s and early 70s was premature and that there was a force uh, that does exist stably in evolutionary systems and that it favors group adaptations. So that is what Wilson and I will presumably be discovering, whether that force is present and if that force exists, what is its nature, and therefore, 
what can it explain? And this, I think, is going to be the key question. Uh, when I was on stage with Richard Dawkins in October, there was a facet of this that arose between us. He and I both emerge from the kin selection branch of the tree of evolutionary biologists, and he is one of the most famous proponents of a narrow Hamiltonian kin selection view. So he's the other end of the spectrum, and indeed on stage he voiced skepticism about the concept that certain large-scale patterns in especially the evolution of humans can be accounted for adaptively. Uh, so he imagines that something like, if I understand his position correctly, something like the religious beliefs of a small band of hunter-gatherers might be adaptive, but that as we scale up these properties to things like uh, sky god religions that we have today, that these would not be adaptive phenomena. He views them as mind viruses. And the question of group selection fits directly into that argument because if group selection exists in the sense that Wilson believes that it does, then it could potentially explain religions as adaptive phenomena. On the other hand, if we use a classic kin selection rubric, we have trouble seeing how evolution can account for that phenomenon, and we fall out closer to where Dawkins is. Uh, I'm not exactly in either camp, even though I emerge from amongst the kin selectionists, because I do believe that evolutionary phenomena explain things like religion, warfare, genocide, these sorts of large-scale phenomena, but I do not believe it emerges from group selection. So sorting that out will be what we uh, do on stage. This seems like a very small part of evolutionary biology. What, what does it affect? How important it is, is it? Can you explain that in kind of layman's terms? Sure. What I would say is the reason that this has the profound importance that it does has to do with the fact that human beings are unusual products of evolution. If group selection or something like it exists in some substantial uh, stable form, then it can alter the evolution of creatures like us that do band together in these large populations of collaborative creatures. So either you have a situation in which we are left with a lot of phenomena that are outside the bounds of an adaptive explanation, or they are within the bounds of an adaptive explanation. Which way you view it changes everything. If uh, genocide, for example, is the product of adaptive evolution, then the kinds of remedies that we might uh, deploy in order to prevent further genocides will be different than if it is a, an accident of history that we have grown to a population size in which our evolutionary instincts are no longer relevant to the circumstances we find ourselves in. You might have a very different set of, um, uh, of protections that you would deploy to prevent it. So, what I think the danger is, is that because the, the landscape of answers and questions in and around group selection and kin selection uh, can seem dry and abstract, people will miss the fact that many of the things they care most deeply about are tied up in this question. Understanding ourselves, human beings, requires us to sort this out once and for all. And so my hope is that the conversation that Wilson and I are headed for will actually break something loose, whereas we've had a kind of, um, I don't know how to describe it exactly, but we've had two very active camps in recent decades, one of which is firmly committed to the idea that group selection not only exists but is, uh, accounts for a huge fraction of what we're most interested in, and another camp that denies the possibility of group selection getting off the ground at all. And because these two view worldviews are can't be reconciled, um, we simply don't make progress. The people, the dyed-in-the-wool kin selectionists have trouble talking to the dyed-in-the-wool group selectionists, and so they're basically two parallel studies of evolution. And it's about time that we figured out what the, the truth of the matter is and got back to it.